nonviolent movements have an advantage when it comes to participation is that it's easier for ordinary people to participate in nonviolent movements compared to armed struggles. So the physical barriers are lower. You don't have to be a young, able-bodied man trained in explosives to participate in nonviolent resistance. You can be young, old, disabled, able-bodied, rich, poor man, woman. Anyone can participate in nonviolent resistance because there are so many ways to get involved in tactics involved in nonviolent resistance that have high levels of risk, so street protest demonstrations, and low levels of risk, so turning on and off lights, banging pots and pans. Uh, so anyone can get involved in various tactics of nonviolent resistance. The commitment barrier is lower. You can be, as we say, a casual rebel and still participate meaningfully in nonviolent resistance. You can still have a day job, a family. You don't have to dedicate your life to insurgency and to be trained as a, as a full-time fighter. You can get involved in different ways. The informational barriers are lower. So armed insurgencies tend to rely on clandestine activities. So a lot of secrecy is involved in violent campaigns. They thrive on them. Although there can be clandestine elements to nonviolent movements, for the most part, they rely on public, open, transparent action. In fact, the way you bring people into a movement is often when they see other people participating in the movement, their friends, their family members, then they want to join. So it relies on openness and transparency. And then the cognitive barriers are lower. So we, all, we know that most, the vast majority of people in any society are never going to be willing to contemplate using violence against another human being. That will always be a distinct minority in any society. And so the, the ability of people to participate in resistance when the methods are nonviolent obviously opens up lots of possibilities to get large numbers of people involved. You don't have to kill or threaten to kill, which is an advantage for nonviolent movements. So people often ask the question, yes, but you know, what happens when the regime or the opponent uses violence against the opposition, a nonviolent or a violent opposition? Can it still work? Can nonviolent resistance still be effective and have, a, have an, a strategic advantage over violent resistance? We found empirically that repression is the norm. Repression coming from a regime or a, another power holder, whether it's a mili military occupier or a corporation or otherwise, is the norm. Over 90% of the campaigns in our study featured some form of mass repression targeting opposition and dissidents. But there is a very clear distinction in the results, in the effects of that violence when the resistance is violent and the resistance is nonviolent. So you see there, again, that the nonviolent campaigns were significantly more likely to succeed compared to the violent campaigns when faced with profound repression. So that also begs the question, why? The major reason why nonviolent resistance has a better chance against violence and repression is that the use of violence against nonviolent protesters and nonviolent movements is much more likely to backfire against the regime or against the perpetrators of violence compared to when the resistance is armed or violent. The use of violence against disciplined nonviolent protesters is much more likely to make the regime lose support and legitimacy. Whereas governments, regimes can always claim self-defense or they can claim that their violence was justified when they're faced with an insurgency. They can always say, of course we're justified in responding with the same or more violence. It's much harder to get away with that when the people that you are either shooting at or repressing are, are dedicated to nonviolent resistance. We also found that 
the level of security force defections, so this is soldiers and police who refuse to obey orders to use violence against protesters, is much higher when the resistance is nonviolent compared to violent. And this is very significant because when, as soon as police and soldiers refuse orders to use violence or to shoot at protesters, it usually means that it's game over for the regime or for the power holder. This is the reason, incidentally, that many governments and regimes try to foment violence in the resistance. So they will send agent provocateurs and instigators in order to get otherwise nonviolent movements to turn to violence. This is very common because they know how to deal with violence. They don't know as well how to deal with disciplined mass nonviolent resistance. And frankly, when security forces see in a crowd of protesting people that it could be their daughters or their friends or their priest, it's much harder to respond with violence compared to a small number of people with weapons. So backfire is more likely to happen when the resistance is nonviolent. And also, this is an important uh, point about repression and when it doesn't work. No regime at the end of the day or power holder can sustain repression indefinitely in the face of sustained and dispersed acts of resistance and non-cooperation. Even if they want to use violence to repress dissent, they cannot mechanically sustain it indefinitely over time. And the important point here is that, and it's a mistake that activists and movements often make, is that it is critically important to alternate between methods of concentration. So these are protests, sit-ins, um, tactics that bring a lot of people together in one place. It's critically important to alternate between those and acts of dispersion. So these are acts like consumer boycotts, refusing to buy products, or stay-at-homes, or labor strikes. Because when you think about it, it's harder to crack down on people who are refusing to buy a certain product or who are, who are going to work but performing less than admirably. So to make the job of the repressor more difficult, it's very important for movements to diversify and innovate tactically. And nonviolent movements, because of the huge number of tactics they have at their disposal, are much more able to do this than armed struggles, generally speaking. Erica Chenoweth and I were not only interested, frankly, in which form of resistance is more effective at achieving the immediate goal of, you know, forcing the removal of a regime or a military occupation. We were, fr frankly, just as, if not more interested in the societal consequences of one resistance type over the other. So we asked the question, what is the relationship between violent and nonviolent resistance and democracy and the level of democratization that follows a campaign, along with the level of civil peace that follows a campaign? So we tested that. And one of the most significant findings is that, yes, we acknowledge that armed campaigns succeed about 25% of the time. So we never make the claim that it never, violence never works. It does. It works about 25% of the time. But we found it's almost impossible for a country to achieve a democratic system, a rights-respecting system, when the resistance is violent and that leads to the transition. So armed insurgencies, when they come to power by the sword, tend to rule by the sword. And so we found, on the other hand, in terms of the democracy scores, this, this slide just shows the relationship between the level of democracy five years after the end of the campaign and the type of resistance, that there was a very strong correlation between the nonviolent resistance campaigns and democracy five years after. And it kind of makes sense why this would be the case. In a way, nonviolent movements are schoolhouses of democracy. 
In order to succeed, you need to promote an alternative vision for the society. You need to build broad-based coalitions. You need to negotiate differences. You need to accept differences of opinion in order to bring large numbers of people on board. So all these skills are transferable to democratic development and to democratization. So not only did democracy have a better chance when the resistance was nonviolent, but also we found that it was very likely for a society which had experienced a major armed conflict or armed insurgency to fall back into civil war after the end of the campaign. And this was much less likely when the resistance was nonviolent. So if you care about the long-term societal consequences um, you know, of a resistance type, then it's very consequential um, which methods people use to achieve their goals. And there was a significant difference in the outcome, both in democracy and in civil peace. Yeah.